I'm Ira Sagalowitz, and I too am a survivor. But my story is quite a bit different from the people who were suffered in the concentration camps. I suffered greatly, but it was a different types of suffering. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my family. The picture you see over here is not the one I usually start my program with. Um, the, the, that's my mother's family, and that little girl on the bottom standing there is my mother. So it's a very old picture. It was taken in 1917. I mean, 1817. Um, what, what, what I want to tell you is basically what happened to that family. What happened to my mother? This is jumping ahead. Um, so I was you know, forgetting this picture right now. Um, the two girls on the very top are the two girls that came to the United States in the 1920s. Um, the rest of the family, and of course the extended family, was quite large by the time the war started. My mother grew up, my mother married, my mother had me, you know, so quite an extended family. And when I was quite young, World War II started. The, the Nazis occupied Poland in a blitzkrieg from all directions, and it didn't take them long to capture Poland. What you should be aware is that shortly before the war started, um, the Nazi regime of Germany and the USSR, Russia at the time, signed an non-aggression pact. Basically, the Nazis told the Russians, we're going to start a war, we're going to capture Poland, you guys sit back, don't interfere with us, and we'll give you part of Poland. And so the day the war started, the Nazis moved into Poland, the Russians moved their borders and took over part of Poland. And it so happened the area where I was born was annexed to Russia. The uh, Russians were, you know, humane occupiers. They had occupied Poland many times before, so it was not unusual um, to have the, the, the Russians running the government. At that time, my father was taken into the army and uh, served in the army. Continued, you know, he was a barber, so he continued to be you know, barbering, you know, in, in the army. And, um, you know, shortly after the war started, you know, things got bad. But nevertheless, everybody was much better on the, Pol on the Russian side than on the, on the German side. The German side of Poland, and as soon as they came in, they, they set up ghettos, concentration camps, and you know, murdered people left and right. And uh, you know, things, things became very bad. Uh, so even though the Russians and, and the uh, Nazis, the Germans, had a, a, a pact, Russia attacked, I mean, Poland, I'm sorry. Germany attacked Russia a year and a half after they attacked Poland. And all the Jewish people on the Russian side knew that as soon as the Nazis came in, they would be in, in peril, and so everybody looked for ways to escape. Because my father was in the army, he was able to get the necessary paperwork to get my mother and myself into a cattle car, uh, a train that was heading someplace into Russia. He didn't know where, uh, but he was able to get the paperwork and he, you know, he pushed us into this cattle car. And shortly thereafter, the train began to move. And within half an hour after we left the station, a German airplane came and began to strafe the train. He was flying up and down and shooting at the train. The conductor stopped the train. My mother and I jumped out of the train, as did everybody else. And uh, when we jumped out of the train, 
my mother fell. But I, being a young boy, continued to run. And according to my mother, when she looked up, uh, she saw me quite a distance away, and she saw something fall from the airplane. She saw a big explosion occur right near where I was. And she, at that point, got up and started running towards where she saw the explosion. And as she was running, she was screaming, you know, she was speaking Yiddish to me. My first language was Yiddish. And she was saying, why did you let go of my hand? Why did you let go of my hand? And she finally came um, to the crater and saw a, a uh, rim of dirt. And laying beside the rim, she found me. She you know, went down. And she shook me, kept shaking me. And at, that, at one point, I opened up my eyes and said, why are, you, why, are you, why are you screaming, mommy? Why are you screaming? Well, she hugged me so hard. Uh, I can still remember that, that hug. In any event, <coughs> we continued um, our journey and finally wound up in the Ural Mountains of Russia in a work camp. Uh, what was happening is the Russians were mobilizing their, uh, you know, their factories, moving them further away from the Germans, and they set up uh, a, a factory town in Ufa, in, you know, in the Ural Mountains. And uh, we were assigned to a barracks that was very long, uh, wasn't insulated, it was uh, each, we had little cubicles, you know, about nine by nine. And uh, my mother, myself, and another family, the Gorky family, were assigned to this. Uh, so it was five of us in, in the nine by nine area. And the only thing we had in that room were two straw mattresses. They basically pillowcases stuffed with straw. And um, the other thing was a bucket. We had a bucket. That was our to toilet. And so um, all the People in the camp, all the, all the women, was primarily women, um, had to work. Uh, and they, uh, they had to perform. They had a quota to perform. And so, um, you know, if you were making guns, you had a certain amount of guns you had to make. Or bullets, you know, a certain amount of bullets. And so if you uh, performed, you got paid at the end of the month. And if you exceeded the quota, you got a reward every second week. And uh, so every second week, we used to get uh, um, a, br a black bread that my mother used to uh, bring to the barracks. And she would cut it up into 14 pieces. And she would put it on the windowsill. And she would say, this is for Monday. This is for Tuesday. You know, and, we uh, survived by knowing primarily that we had a piece of bread each day. Now, as I said, everybody got paid, and the payment was in the form of a sack of potatoes and about 10 pounds of flour, and you had to survive on, on that for, for a month. And that's two of us to survive on that for a month. So, But uh, we kept surviving, kept, uh, you know, doing the best we could. Uh, my mother, whenever she would come back from work, that's what she looked like. That's not my mother, by the way. <laughs> but that's what she looked like. She, she, that's my memory of, you know, of her. And she had to walk about a kilometer, you know, from where the factory was to the barracks where we were in. And, uh, you know, she, she did her best to, to survive. Um, one day she came in and she was sitting there. You know, we covered, we would cover her up with the mattress, and she would shiver. And we noticed that her finger became black, and and that it was growing. The the, the injury, the blackness, was going moving, and so the finger had to be amputated uh, shortly thereafter. 
um, otherwise, you know, it was, she was frostbitten. Uh, the temperature in the Ural Mountains is for about nine months or so, it's below zero. The rest of the time, it's still not, <laughs> still pretty close to zero. So, um, but we got, kept on surviving and kept going. Um, <coughs> um, finally, um, we, the war ended and we, started walking back to our town, to back to Poland from the Ural Mountains in Russia. And so we walked for thousands of miles, uh, living off the land, uh, eating whatever we could, finding potatoes, uh, finding roots to eat. And uh, we uh, finally came to Sarny, only to find the, the town totally demolished. Um, the Nazis had come through, they uh, destroyed the whole town. Um, we also learned that as soon as the Nazis came into town, they set up a concentration camp and had rounded up uh, 14,000 Jewish and other people, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, gypsies, uh, people of uh, color, uh, all kinds of people that they didn't like. And uh, uh, finally, they decided to, to liquidate the camp. And so they set up machine guns around the camp and they murdered most of the people in the camp. And some of them survived, uh, about a hundred or so survived. And, you know, uh, but life was tough for them. Uh, we, as I say, um, were in Sarny, no house, no food, no nothing, and what do you do? Well, luckily, the U.S. Army had set up DP camps throughout Europe, displaced persons camps throughout Europe. Uh, the camps were set up by, word, by destination. If you wanted to go to Canada, you went to a camp that's designated for Canada, one for the United States, another one for uh, another country. But in order to get into those camps, uh, you had to have some proof that uh, you have family in that country. And in our case, we didn't have any kind of proof. Everything we had was lost. Um, and so, um, the only, the only camp that was set up and that would take us was a camp for Israel, for Palestine at the time. And so uh, that camp was in Halein by Salzburg in Austria. So again, we began to walk from Poland, Czechoslovakia, down, down all the way to Austria. And we finally got to the camp and uh, that was, you know, like having compared to what it was, you know, I mean, uh, the army provided us with food, the army provided us with, uh, uh, with clothing, you know, we, and heat in the barracks, you know, and, uh, and for the first time in, in five years, I actually slept on a cot rather than on the floor. Uh, so things, things were extremely good. Now my mother, um, too bad the picture's gone. My mother knew uh, that uh, she had two sisters in the United States, but she didn't know where or when. Uh, and, and so there were, there were organizations that did that kind of a job, tried to reunite people. And in case of my mother, uh, she uh, knew about the two sisters. And finally, the Hayas, uh, that's one of the organizations, found my mother's sisters, and uh, the day that she did, when we got the news, it was just the most joyful day of my mother's life, you know. Uh, I, I never saw her that happy, you know, after going, losing all her parents, losing everything, you know, sisters and brothers, finding two of her sisters was just the greatest joy. So we, um, we thought um, they immediately sent us a visa and uh, 
we thought we were going to the United States any day now. Well, the United States had a quota. They would only allow a certain amount of Jewish people from different lists, you know. So if you were uh, on a list from Hungary, you, you know, it would allow a certain amount of people, a list from Poland and a certain amount of people. And so we waited five years in Austria and in the DP camp for our turn to come to the United States. We finally came uh, on the SS steward to the United States in 1951. And my parents went to work right away. My mother, by the way, remarried when we were in the DP camp. Uh, she married Aaron Turetsky, who was a partisan in, in the Russian army. And uh, he had lost both his, two, of, two of his children and his wife. And uh, um, we uh, began to live life again, you know. Uh, uh, I, of course, I couldn't speak, not, none of us could speak English yet, you know, but we learned kind of quickly and uh, uh, life went on. Um, my, I, I, very, I remember very distinctly my first day in the United States. I woke up early and I had, my aunts had put me up uh, in the living room on a couch and uh, it was a shy, you know, very, very bright day. I woke up, must have been at six o'clock and uh, um, Cindy, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so w woke up uh, at, at six o'clock, and my aunts had provided me with uh, white shirt, white pants, uh, white sneakers. I put that on. I went into. I went outside. The sun was shining. I laid down on the grass, and I said, "God, this must be heaven," you know. So, uh, and I've been very, very grateful. Uh, to the United States, you know, for all these years, you know. I've done well, I think. I was able to find very, very interesting positions in the United States. Uh, I provided uh, communication systems throughout Europe for the U.S. Army, for NATO, and I uh, put in the uh, distribution system here in Ohio and for, you know, throughout the world. Uh, so, uh, and finally, I, uh, I, I worked for 30 years for ITT, and uh, they made me president of one of their companies for a number of years. So, that's pretty much my story. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Bye-bye.